Uh, go ahead and take your Bible, turn to the book of Acts, chapter 1, and um, maybe, maybe we'll get into uh, Acts chapter 2 tonight before we, uh, before we get done. Um, I don't know, but I, I, I don't, I really don't watch the news uh, really anymore, especially like I used to before uh, the 2020 election. And I, I just don't really, I won't say right now, I don't know anything that's going on, but something is peculiar to me. And that is the lack of information that we have about the, the assassin. Uh, you know, they they gave us a name, Crooks. That makes sense. Uh, and he's 20 years old. And that's about it. Has anybody else heard anything else beside that? He's smarter than Secret Service. Did you see him up on the rooftop? Everybody saw him up on the rooftop. That's, <laughs> that's something that's troubling, I think. When, when he was in high school... He was in a Black Rock advertisement. Black yeah, Rock. I saw that. But I, I don't think he had a speaking part, but he, no. was, he was in it. They're not telling us, you know, the things that, that would normally come out, especially, you know, three or four days now since the shooting. And usually we would have this whole big thing about who he was and where he came from and possibly why he did it and and on and on. I mean, the guy did the guy write a manifesto because, you know, that's what they usually do. They write some big manifesto and then they go and they do something they know is going to get him killed. And uh, they leave all these instructions and, and all these details. They write them down somewhere on why they did what they did. But I'm not hearing anything about the guy. All I know is they shot his head off. And that's it. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, I heard that too. Um, what he thought, I don't know what he thought he was going to do with that. You know, because pretty much once you shoot at somebody who is a former president and soon to be a president... You pretty much don't figure now, okay, I'll slide off of here at exactly 5.04, and then I'll sneak over to my car, and I'll blow it up. I, I did hear that he had voted for Republican in the past, and he had donated money to the Republican Party. They said it wasn't a large sum of money. It was just small amounts. So why did he shoot? Why, and why indeed did he do it? Why, indeed. I think he got paid. Yeah, who knows. Yeah. So anyway, I don't know. There's just a lot of, uh, lot of unanswered questions. And it's funny. It is hilarious to see the uh, hypocrisy coming from those on the left wing, like the view... The view is going, oh, this is so terrible. This is not how we are as Americans. We don't set... And I'm going, you people, especially Whoopi Goldberg, been daring somebody to do exactly what they did for years now. They've been hoping somebody would do this. Where's Robert De Niro now? Where is he at? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and and they're and they're, of course they're all saying now we need to we need to tone down the rhetoric now. You're the one's been raising it up. You hate this man. No, I don't think it's hate. I think it's fear. They fear him so much that they wanted someone to do what 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 they tried to do Saturday and it didn't work and uh, so now they're all like oh we, we, we didn't want that oh no we didn't want that Biden's 
Huh? Biden's got the COVID. Yeah, that's what Roy said. Yeah, they announced it before I came. Yeah, I think he snipped the hair of some girl that had COVID. That's how he got it. Yeah. I left my cup. I left my cup. All right, well, let's get into the Word of God tonight. Enough uh, conspiracy theorizing. And uh, Acts chapter 1. And I tell you what, it's been a while uh, since we had uh, service here on Wednesday night. I want to I go back and I'm just going to read uh, from uh, Acts chapter 1, 1 down uh, through uh, where we're going to start with tonight. Uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 1, if you have your Bible there, oh, the former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Who wrote the book of Acts? Who did, who, who authored this? Do you remember? Huh? Nope. Who wrote it? Luke. Very good. Um, and because he, he also mentions Theophilus in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, both to do and to teach. Verse 2, until the day in which he was taken up after that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments uh, unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he shewed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. This is very, very important. Christ gave them an instruction and he wants them to obey it. Uh, they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait. If you have a red letter Bible, that's in red letters. Meaning that Jesus said it. Wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water. But ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. And again, this is, this is Christ now telling us something that, a, a lesson that we should all learn. And that is, don't try to get ahead of God. Don't think that you must initiate God's plan. Don't think that God is waiting for you to take a leap of faith. None of that. If God teaches us anything in his word, it is to wait. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Uh, you, I don't know how many times that word wait is in the Bible. But I imagine it's in there quite a bit. I'm thinking of a, of a, of a story right now in 2 Chronicles where Jehoshaphat, uh, he's got three armies coming against him in Jerusalem. And he knows, he knows they're all going to die. He knows that his army, and he, does, he doesn't have the army, he doesn't have the men, he doesn't have the weaponry to defeat these three armies. He can't do it. So he calls upon God. They have a day of fasting and prayer. And, and people put on sackcloth and sprinkled ashes on their head. And they humbled themselves before God. And God told them, be not, dis be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours, but God's. And so God tells his people to go up on side of this mountain. And to sing praises to him all morning. And watch what God does. And so they do exactly that. The three armies come down. I love this scene. The three armies come down. They each three think that the other two is the Jews and they start fighting each other and killing one another all the way down to the last man that uh, just uh, the last two guys stabbing each other at the same time falling down at the same time no one else left standing and the Jews up on the on the side of the mountain are watching this and God said well what are you waiting on now Go get the spoil. And so the Bible says they were three days 
picking through the bodies, getting all the gold off their, off those soldiers, going in their tents, getting all their stuff that they had in their tents, stealing everything they got. Actually, they wasn't stealing it. They didn't need it anymore. Because once you're dead, you don't need stuff anymore. And so they went and got all that stuff. And they got all that because they waited on the Lord. That's a very important. So God, Jesus tells them here to wait, wait for the promise of the Father. So verse 6, when they were therefore were come together, they asked of him saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And we covered that as well. Um, Jesus said unto them, he said unto them in verse 7, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. So in other words, I'll, Jesus is saying the Father will bring in the kingdom when the Father is ready to bring in the kingdom. I will be in charge of it. You, you won't miss it. I promise you, you won't miss it. Uh, but it'll happen in God's timing. Not our timing. Not what we say it's going to happen but how God says it's going to happen. Um, and I was talking a little bit about that Sunday morning concern, in, in Sunday school concerning the rapture. A lot of people think they've got it all figured out when it's going to happen, or, or let me say, uh, in relation to other biblical events, they think they've got it all figured out, and even there are some churches, and again, I, I respect... Um, their beliefs because they believe the King James and uh, I don't uh, uh, just as a rule I don't really go against uh, other ministries or other churches that use and believe the King James that's sort of off limits for me uh, but some of them actually have it in their um, in their church's doctrinal statement and you cannot be a member of that church unless you agree to that and, uh, and, and if that's, I mean, if that's their church, if that's how they want to do it, that's fine and so on. Um, but Jesus plainly says it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But you shall receive power, verse 8. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth, four places, four gospels. And so we have a match here. And then verse 9, and when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Who were these men? Angels. Angels. Very good, Dave. You get uh, two points for that. One, one for each angel. I don't know what the prize is. I don't have a prize, but anyway. Uh, so, verse 11, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So, he went up in a cloud... He's coming back in a cloud. We studied that uh, both here and also when um, in our Revelation study. Uh, by the way, who, does anybody remember when I started that study in Revelation Sunday School? Somebody, somebody's asking for all of the um, all of the teaching audios just on the book of Revelation. And Lisa asked me, she said, when did you start that? And I said, do you remember bell bottoms? <laughs> it wasn't quite that long ago. But it was a long time ago, and I'm not—I'm not sure. I'm not sure we—I'm not sure we can fill that order. That's, that goes back a long time. Um, but anyway, it, it, maybe maybe we can get it together. Um, let's see here, verse eleven again. 
uh, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. So we've been, we've been dealing with the issue of the clouds, uh, both uh, in our Revelation uh, Bible study and in here. And so in verse 12 uh, is where we're going to pick it up. That's what's up on the screen. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. Does anybody know what a Sabbath day's journey is? A Sabbath day's journey. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, on the Sabbath day, the, the Jews had made up all of these rules of what you could and could not do concerning the law. And God never, ever said anything about how far a person could walk on the Sabbath day. He said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou work and do all thy labor. But the seventh day is holy unto the Lord and you shall rest in it. So God never actually placed a restriction on how far you could journey on the Sabbath day. What he was doing, in, in my opinion, he mentions later, servile labor. In other words, if you, uh, if you were working and part of your job required you to walk into town to buy materials and back and so on, you couldn't do that on the Sabbath day. Um, but anyway, the Jews, here's what they did. They wrote a commentary on the law. And that, that was all the rules of, of things they could and could not do concerning the law. Years later, since the commentary on the law then became the law itself, then they wrote a commentary on the commentary of the law to further pin down and put it down in no uncertain terms exactly what could and could not be done on the Sabbath day. And that's what Jesus was referring to when, when he uh, talked about the, the scribes and the Pharisees being hypocrites. Uh, he said, you, you have through your tradition uh, made void the law. In other words, you've come up with so many stupid rules of things that you could and could, like one of them was you couldn't look in a mirror on a Sabbath day could, because if you did, you might see a nose hair and pull it out. That would be work. And you can't do that. Uh, I remember when I was in my third year of Bible college, I was in Nashville, Tennessee. And the college campus itself was located in a uh, sort of a wealthy neighborhood in Nashville itself. And uh, the the building, some of the buildings that we had, like the library building, was a mansion. It was an old mansion. And um, right next to our campus was a Jewish synagogue, a temple. And so on Saturday, all of these Jews that were in this very wealthy neighborhood, here they would come walking through our campus to go to temple. And the rules were that somebody had to go the Friday before, before dark, turn on all the lights and uh, get turn on whatever air conditioner or furnace or whatever. All of that had to be done on a Friday because they couldn't turn a light switch on on Saturday. That's how picky they got. And then somebody had told me, uh, you'll see those people walking back and forth through the campus uh, they won't talk to you. And I'm going, well, I bet they'll talk to me. So here I see them coming one Saturday. I'm waiting for them. How are you folks doing today? It's good to see you. And I mean, they didn't even look at me. They just kept on walking. How rude. 
But they certainly weren't going to talk to a goyim, a Gentile, on the Sabbath day. And so they did. They kept those rules. And according to them, their keeping of those rules satisfies God's demands as far as righteousness. Didn't matter what sin they committed. If they did these rules correctly, they could be forgiven of those sins. And that's just how they were. Anyway, um, where was I going with that? Verse, oh, a Sabbath day journey. Verse 12, uh, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. Verse 13, and when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James. Now count those for me very quickly in verse 13. How many names do we have here? Eleven. Eleven. Very good. Boy, you count fast. I was counting them as seven. You've been listening to me, haven't you? You count things in the Bible. Who's missing? Judas. Judas. Judas is missing. He killed himself. Yeah, hung himself. Um, and he was hanging out there. The Bible says he had hang, hung out there so long that his body basically rotted off the rope and fell. Anyway, we'll get to that. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we ask your blessings now upon your word tonight. We love you and we thank you, Lord, for gathering us together in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, uh, verse 14 now, these all uh, continued, let me, let me get over, yeah. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Look at that. Because one of the, one of the fundamental doctrines of the Catholic Church is what is referred to as the perpetual virginity of Mary not only was she a virgin when she conceived Christ but after she gave birth to him she did not um, join together with Joseph her husband she was a perpetual virgin and when Catholics refer to Mary to this day they refer to her as the Virgin Mary. Now, this verse plainly tells you that you have Mary, the mother of Jesus, with his brethren. In other words, the brothers, which in this case would be half-brothers, uh, they were the sons of Joseph and Mary, they were there in the upper room with their mother, Mary, and she was not a perpetual virgin after she gave birth to Christ. She was not. Now, uh, there is a study that I just started doing, and so I don't know enough about it to say anything about it. But the idea of Mary being a virgin is actually based upon ancient paganism because there, there is existing in just about every ancient religion the idea of a, a virgin goddess. They all have one. And I think the idea of Mary being a virgin is based upon those ancient goddesses who were also characterized as virgins. Like I say, I don't know enough about it yet to say much, uh, but it's, it's something that I am studying out. And so anyway, Mary, the mother of Jesus, with his brethren. Now, verse 15. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of names together were about an hundred and twenty. And I want you to notice that the number 12 keeps popping up here. Uh, we're eventually going to have 
12 disciples again. We have in this grouping, we have 120 people. That's 12 times 10. The significance of the number 12, um, I think I will I'll probably, um, probably wait until next Wednesday night to get into that. But the significance of the number 12, uh, I think, is important. 12... Uh, what would you say the number 12 represents? Just if you were to take a guess. Huh? 12 disciples. 12. 12 tribes. Okay. And what else is in 12s? Donuts. Donuts. Yeah, let's all stand and be dismissed. Did you bring 12 donuts? Then don't bring it up ever again. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. In what way? Okay, I do. Um... Well, I have it in my notes. We'll get there. Okay. You have the 12 tribes. You have the 12 disciples. Um, th think like this. Okay. You have the camp of the Israelites. And all 12 tribes were told to camp in a specific spot. Judah was always uh, to the east, even though he wasn't the firstborn. You could tell that God has great plans for the tribe of Judah. Judah is, of course, the tribe that Jesus came from. It's the fourth tribe. Dan, the tribe of Dan, is always to the north. And when they, when they uh, pack up and they're going to follow God through the wilderness, Judah is always first. Dan is always last. He's the tail, as it were. And um, then by the time we get to uh, Revelation 7, Dan is completely gone. Dan is not mentioned as being um, uh, one of the tribes that's sealed in the last days, which to me is very, very interesting. God has rejected Dan for some reason. Uh, but anyway, you have this, this whole scenario where you have the 12 tribes there. How many months are there? 12, okay? And we have 12 months because it's based upon the motions of the sun, and the moon, and the stars. One of the things that God said about the tribes of Israel, the people of Israel, and, and of us eventually, is that they shall be as the stars of heaven for number. Okay? Now, number one... Uh, that could mean, and I think it does mean, that it's going to be a humongous number of Jews uh, that finally in the last days, um, just like the stars of heaven, there's an innumerable company of angels and so on. But I also believe if every month when you look up, there's a different group of stars directly above your head. Okay? And people call them the 12 constellations. Uh, they call it the zodiac. I don't like the term zodiac. Number one, it's not in the Bible. Number two, the word zodiac means a circle of beasts. Zoa is like beast or living creatures. And um, we know that stars are angels. And so uh, in Psalm 19, God tells us that... The stars in the heavens, the heavens themselves, are a tabernacle for the sun. Meaning the sun goes from the east and it travels in the sky all the way to the west. And it's like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. So we know that it's referring to Christ. Uh, the sun is Christ and he's going through his tabernacle. When they established the tabernacle in the wilderness, everything went from east to west. When the high priest goes into the tabernacle, he goes in 
through the east door. There's only one door and it's in the east. And he goes into the holy place and then he goes into the most holy place, which is to the to the west. OK, so think about it. Let's see. How can I explain this? What I've got in my mind here. Um, do what? Oh, you were yawning. OK, I thought you had something really profound to say. OK, that's all right. So anyway, think of those 12 tribes as being the constellations up in the sky. Christ moving through those constellations, being part of it and so on. Um, the stars rule over the night. There's your government. OK, the stars and the moon, they they rule over the night. The sun rules over the day. OK, so it's important that there were always 12 tribes. Now, I mentioned in Revelation seven, Dan is taken out. Well, then that would only leave 11 tribes, right? No, because what God does is that he has taken the tribe of Joseph Divided it in two. You have Joseph represented by Ephraim. And then you have the half tribe of Manasseh. So that even if Dan is taken out, you still have 12. Does that make sense to everybody? Now, Judas, like Dan, has been taken out. Does there have to be another disciple put in his place. Yes, 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 yes. Because God is a God of order. And once God establishes an order, it remains that way. I am the Lord. I change not. So we are going to, uh, as we go through this, we're going to see that that's exactly what they do. That's the purpose of Peter standing up here. He's going to tell them, we've got to elect another apostle to be in Judas's place. So now that I've explained that, let's move on. Look in verse. Um, let's see here. Look at verse 16. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled. And that's another thing. Scripture cannot be broken. If God says something and it's written down in this book, it must take place. It has to happen. You cannot have an unfulfilled scripture. You can't do it. Because if, if the Bible predicts something is going to happen, but it doesn't happen, then what does that say about the Bible? We don't, have to, we don't have to abide by it. We don't have to live by it. It's all over with. And I think that's really at the core of what the devil tries to do. Is that he tries to get some part of scripture to fail. Because if it fails, then by God's own word, the whole, you don't have to listen to anything that's in the Bible. Remember what Jesus said in uh, Hebrews. He's quoting, uh, it's quoted in the book of Psalms. Uh, he said, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Jesus is coming to do everything that's in the book. And don't let anybody, I say this a thousand times, I'm going to say it again. Do not let anybody convince you that God does things that are outside of the Bible. And I've had, I've had people say that to me. Mike, not everything that God does is in the scriptures. Oh, yes, it is. Oh, yes, it is. All right, now, uh, let's look at verse, yeah, verse 16 again. Uh, Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. Verse 17, for he was numbered. Look at that. He was numbered with us. And what was that number? Twelve. He was numbered with us 
So the Bible's telling you that the number has to be filled. Uh, he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. In other words, Judas had a place there amongst the twelve. Uh, we know that he was the banker, as it were. He was the accountant. He had the bag, meaning that any money that they collected, Judas was responsible for carrying it. But what does the Bible tell us about Judas? He was a thief. He was stealing the money. And then what was it that convinced him to betray Jesus? Honey. 30 pieces of silver. I don't know how much that would have been, but apparently it, it got his attention. And so he was going to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Now, verse 18. Now, this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity and falling headlong. Remember, he's hanging there and he's hanging there by a rope, but eventually, because of the what happens to the human body after so many days, pieces started coming off of him. Um, I, I, I'm going to go ahead and... No, nah, I, I won't, I won't. I have something interesting to, to say, but I, I won't. It doesn't really fit in this in this uh, situation here. It's about it's about what part of the body corrupts first. Okay, uh, you can ask me after church. Um, but his body's falling apart, and so he fell headlong. He burst asunder in the midst and all his bowels gushed out. In other words, he fell a great distance. And when he hit the rocks below, <sighs> grotesque. Verse 19, and it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem. Insomuch as that field is called in their proper tongue, Akeldama. Who has a, a King James Bible where they have the pronunciation marks. JR, you got one? The C here has got a mark over it, doesn't it? And on the A C E L D A M A? Huh? It doesn't show that. It's pronounced Akeldama. I used to say Aseldama, but it's Akeldama. That is to say, the field of blood. And obviously, for when his body fell, it exploded and blew blood all over the place. Um, there is a, f a funny story. There's years ago, uh, there was a humongous whale that washed ashore up in New England. And they actually captured this on film. The news crew was there back in the days when they had film cameras instead of videotape. And the, the whale, it was, I mean, it was humongous. It was large. And it was smelling, it was stinking so bad that they all decided we've got to get rid of this thing, but we don't know how. Finally, somebody said, why don't we blow it up? True story now. Why don't we blow it up? The problem was no one knew how much dynamite it took to blow up a whale. So they dug underneath as much as they could. They packed all of that with dynamite. Uh, got ready to ignite it. They pulled everybody back hundreds of yards away and they did a countdown three two one kaboom it rained whale parts for like two to three minutes 
whale stuff was coming down all over everybody. Some of the people got hurt because they were getting hit by, by whale pieces. And they said the smell was so bad that people literally were almost to the point of going, passing out because the stench they had created was so bad. And they got it all on film, though. Yeah, true story. Uh, verse 20, uh, for it is written, look at this now. Here's, this is important. Um, there are people, and I, I, and I respect their disagreements, but I believe they're wrong. And I've had people write me and, and, and tell me that uh, the election of Matthias to be the replacement apostle was wrong, that Matthias was never intended by God to be the 12th apostle, that that belonged to Apostle Paul. And so, uh, but I do not agree with that at all. And number one, the Bible does not anywhere tell us that the addition of Matthias to the 12, that God... Uh, later on corrected it or that God was angry because they did it uh, and, and, and told Peter that they had done wrong. There, there's nothing in the scriptures at all that tells us point blank or indicates or even hints to the idea that the addition of Matthias was something that the, the apostles got wrong. They, they did it the wrong way and Matthias was not supposed to be um, the 12th disciple. Look at, um, look at verse 20. Peter is quoting scripture and saying, For it is written in the book of Psalm, Let his habitation be desolate. He's talking about Judas. Uh, and let no man dwell therein. And his bishopric let another take. So, Peter is following Scripture's orders. He's doing what the Bible tells him to do by giving the office that Judas had to someone else. And so he says, verse 21, Wherefore of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, Beginning, verse 22, beginning um, from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And so, verse 23, they appointed, yeah, they appointed to Joseph called Barsabbas, Who's, who was surnamed Justice and Matthias. Now, the qualifications were that these men must have accompanied the disciples while Jesus was on this earth. They, they, have, they were witnesses of his resurrection. They saw it. They believed it. And I don't think either one of these guys was going, you know, if, if, if Judas is out, maybe I can be the next apostle. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to get, uh, get myself in uh, really close with Peter and, and John and James and those guys. And, and, and that way they'll pick me. I, I don't think that at all about these guys. I think they were just humble men that had no idea that um, th that they were going to be chosen to replace Judas and be listed among the twelve. I, I, I think they were just, they believed Jesus, they followed Jesus, they were witnesses of his crucifixion, of his resurrection, they believed it. And so when Peter said, we've got two here that are qualified, 
And so, in verse 24, and they prayed. That to me is very important. They prayed. Now, the, the people who want, uh, the people who disagree that Matthias and or Justice, neither one of them could have been the twelfth disciple. Um, I just think that with the disciples praying here and asking God, God, will you show us which one of these men is to be the replacement? I don't see where God is letting these guys be fooled by it. They prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen. They're not asking for their choice. They're saying, God, you show us the one that you choose. Now, if God would have intended for Paul to be the one to replace Judas, I'm sure that God would have found some way to let these guys know, uh, guys, it's neither one of them. I have Judas's replacement. I already know who it is, and in due season, I'll reveal it to you. Yes, sir. So at the time that Peter's, you know, telling them that we need to replace Judas, yeah. where is Paul in his life? Is he still killing Christians? Paul, Paul right now, we don't know. We don't know how old Paul was at this time. He, he may have been a, a, a fairly young man. Uh, it isn't till a few years later in, uh, in Acts chapter 7 that we, that we are introduced to the Apostle Paul by his name Saul. Because... In, in Acts chapter 7 is when Stephen, who is one of the first deacons, uh, he, is, he is on trial because he's been preaching in the name of Jesus and he preaches this message to the Jewish elders and they hate his guts now and so they're going to take him out and stone him. And the Bible says that there was one who was there who was holding their coats and it was Saul, which was Paul. Saul was holding the coats of all the guys who were stoning Stephen, okay? So that's when we're first introduced to Saul. And, uh, but, and at that time, you're right, if, if Saul uh, was of any adult age at this time, he's still not on God's side. He hates Christians. And so, but, and, but we're talking about a time when the Holy Ghost hasn't even been poured out, okay? So... Uh, the issue of Saul just isn't in the picture anywhere. But what I'm saying is, if God would have intended that neither one of these men were to be the replacement for Judas, God would have somehow, some way, shown those guys it's, it's neither one of them. Okay? And they would have waited for God to pick. But they prayed and they asked God to pick the one. And so the Bible says that um, verse 26, they gave forth their lots. They had some form of lottery and um, however that was, whether it was, I don't know, a piece of paper with writing on it or a stick or dice or something like that, we just don't know, but they gave forth their lots and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. I think, I think Matthias then would have gotten every single vote. I think God would have worked it out that way, that he got every single vote without any dissension whatsoever. And so, as, as far as I'm concerned, this is over with. And I'll, and I'll give you one other reason why. So, number one, uh, we have uh, Peter following scriptures the scripture says that somebody else must take his office he must be we got to have 12 in other words we've got 11 that's not enough jesus picked 12 the number is 12 and so we have to have a 12th man 
And so uh, they follow the scriptures. Then they select these two men. Then they pray and say, God, show us which of these men you choose. And again, I just don't see God. The, I mean, these are the apostles. These are godly men. I don't see God letting them make a mistake like picking a, uh, the, uh, the apostle. But then I found this. Uh, turn to Acts chapter 6. Up until now, they were referred to as the eleven. But now, it's different. Acts chapter 6, verse 1. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then, here it is, the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them. The twelve refers to all of the apostles, including Matthias. So the scriptures now have put Matthias and numbered him with the other eleven so that now that group of men is no longer referred to as the eleven. They are referred to as the twelve. And this, as I said, this is before the Apostle Paul. This is uh, in Acts chapter 6, they choose the deacons. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen preaches and gets in trouble. And then he is uh, stoned and Saul is holding their coats. And then after that, Saul is breathing threats and murders against the disciples of the Lord. Okay. Then um, Saul wants to go on the road to Damascus and he doesn't know he's going to meet Jesus there, but he does. Now, think of, it, think of it like this. So we have Judas, he's gone. Matthias is in. Now we have the 12. But we also have a 13th, the Apostle Paul. You had that same situation back in the Old Testament when you had all of the tribes listed, including Levi, which would have been 12, but God had always divided up the tribe of Joseph into two, Ephraim, and the Bible always refers to it as the half-tribe of Manasseh. The half-tribe of Manasseh. The half-tribe of Manasseh. All through there. So how many technically do you have? Thirteen. Just like with the, uh, just like with the apostles in the New Testament. You have an extra one that's counted in there. All right? All right. That's, that's enough for tonight. That's a lot to chew on. And um, like I say, I, I, I can kind of see some people's points. And actually, I think, um, I think the pastor that I uh, was sort of trained under, Preacher Golf, I think he might have uh, also not thought that Matthias was uh, really a, a true apostle. Um, but when I saw this verse here in Acts chapter 6, then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples, it's clear to me that the word of God, the scriptures, counts Matthias as the twelfth, the twelfth man, okay? The twelfth apostle. So, all right. Any questions?